Welcome back, and thank you for joining me today as we continue through Kindled Magic, the first volume of the Pathfinder 2 Adventure Path, Strength of Thousands. There's going to be two parts to this video. The first section will have some light spoilers, but is mostly going to focus on some general GM tips you can use when running downtime in your games, something this campaign has an awful lot of. The second section will contain full spoilers as we break down Chapter 2 of the first adventure. I'll clearly call out when the spoilers start, in case you want to duck out at that point. Chapter 2 is where the Magambia and the student's academic life really opens up. It's the first of several chapters in both books 1 and 2, where rather than a linear set of quests or objectives, the book presents a series of events to the GM which can be inserted into the plot over the course of a longer time frame. Since this isn't the last time this adventure path uses this model of storytelling, I'd encourage you to consider up front what type of story you and your players want to tell at the table. The question I ask myself in each campaign is, do I want to tell a story where a few days pass, or do I want to tell a story where specifically three days pass? While most tables use both approaches at certain points, I'd really encourage you to pick one primary way that you want to approach each campaign. Whether you intend to or not, each style is going to incentivize certain types of play, and each one is going to have its own strengths and weaknesses. Marking time by saying a few days pass intentionally takes away the ability to mark time on a calendar. It puts the focus on the main story and turns your game's pace into that of more of a movie. There are few if any filler scenes because you're moving quickly from adventure to adventure. The game stays exciting and momentous most of the time. If your players spent a long week in class or at work, they may not want to spend their gaming time worrying about homework assignments at a fictional school, so this could be a good approach for that kind of table. It also makes sure that everyone at the table is staying engaged for the whole session. Since everyone's character should have a strong motivation to be involved in the main story or narrative, you're rarely at risk of players struggling to find a way to tie their character to certain events. The thing to watch out for if you take this approach is characters interacting with the world. In this style, NPCs can become one-dimensional quest givers, and environments can turn into white room lobbies that the characters are waiting in until the camera zooms in on the next encounter or plot point. To avoid this, look for ways to tie NPCs and locations more front and center into your encounters. Add short scenes for your players to interact with NPCs that aren't directly tied to receiving a quest, and make NPCs more present in the encounters themselves, either accompanying players in their journeys or just randomly showing up at encounter locations. Even if you're more focused on a central narrative, this can make your world feel more lived in. On the other hand, specifically saying how many days or weeks pass give your players another resource to play with. Time. The pace turns into more of an epic novel. Players are giving more thought to their characters' daily routines, such as when they head to the dining hall each day, what they're spending their time on, studying, earning income, or something else. Which PC and NPC students are they spending time with on a daily basis? If your players put together more elaborate backstories and reasons why their characters wanted to be at the Magambia, this might be the kind of game that they're looking for. And Strength of Thousands is the rare pre-written adventure path that really gives room for characters to breathe and achieve goals beyond those explicitly set out in the adventure. So if this sounds like fun for you and your players, this is a great AP to really lean into that. Another benefit with this style is it interacts much more cleanly with all of the other downtime systems present in Pathfinder 2. Crafting, earn income, tree training, all of these other activities have explicit time requirements measured in hours or days. And if your players are interested in engaging deeply with those systems, it can be frustrating to hear that a few weeks pass without them being able to determine how their character spent each day of that time. They may even try to slow down the game to request resolving all of those checks. The thing to watch out for in this model of downtime is 
player engagement around the table. By its nature, a lot of this character building and downtime is done one player at a time meaning players have to wait a while for their turn in the spotlight. Some players might also just not be interested in this detailed level of role-playing daily life or the crunchy detail of learning all of those additional downtime systems in addition to just how to play their character in encounter mode. You can avoid this by giving the players who don't have the spotlight something to do whether that's a more elaborate academia subsystem to interact with, giving them an NPC classmate to roleplay alongside you while you're interacting with other players, or just being okay with the fact that people may zone in and out and use that as an opportunity to check their messages or refill their drink. I think this last one is important. You are not failing as a GM if the players aren't hanging on your every word for four hours straight. Your barometer should be, are people continuing to show up to my game every week? If they are, you're doing an amazing job, my friend, and keep it up. On the topic of other Academia subsystems, there are a number of homebrew expansions to the Strength of Thousand system out there, both on Reddit and on the Paizo forums. And of course, being the dork that I am, I also made my own, with the goal of being able to allow players to get more specific with their studies and downtime activities, while still being able to move the calendar forward weeks or months at a time. I'm not going to get too much more into the detail of that system, since moving forward, I want to focus this series on helping you run your game, rather than recounting what I did for mine. But if you're interested, let me know in the comments and I can share more information or perhaps create a short video on the system I made. Once you've decided what kind of downtime you want to run, it will give you a pretty good idea of how to incorporate Chapter 2 and future chapters like it, which feature those series of smaller adventures and quests. Now, here's where we're going to start getting into the spoiler section, so if you want to avoid spoilers for Strength of Thousands, best to click off now and we'll see you next time. For the rest of my Strength of Thousands GMs, we left off our last video at the end of chapter one, with the party having completed their perquisite tasks and fighting off an ambush from Kurishkin, the gremlin who revealed the presence of Stone Ghost. Stone Ghost is a mysterious apparition who has been rallying the various gremlin groups and is our main antagonist for book one. As always, I like to start by reviewing what I think the goals of the chapter are in the larger story so I can make sure that each scene at the table is working towards it. This chapter has two goals. Establish what a day in the life looks like at the Magambia, classes, studying, and downtime as we discussed. Having a solid plan for what style of downtime you want to use really helps here. The second goal is emphasizing the presence of the many insects around the Magambia as unusual and troubling to the teachers, and eventually outright threatening. Building up the insect threat provides both the motivation that the characters need to descend into the tunnels in Chapter 3, as well as sets the stage for the main conflict throughout the rest of the AP teacher Ulawa and her struggles with the Vesican Egg. But before we get too far ahead of ourselves, Chapter 2 starts off with the characters being introduced to Koride Ulawa, a character who I would consider the other main teacher of the adventure path, and very much the Snape to Teacher Ott's Dumbledore. Teacher Ulawa is short, she's direct, she plays favorites, and she doesn't coddle her students. But my reading of her is that she very much cares about the Magambia and her students. She's just using different tactics to protect them. So don't forget to portray that aspect of her as well. Her directive to collect insect samples takes the students all over the Magambia grounds and is a great way to introduce locations and NPCs to the players. Especially if you're having a hard time building relationships with NPC students, having PCs run into their classmates while traveling between locations or having the students hanging out at the speaker stage or leshy gardens can help build atmosphere that the Magambia is a living place that students are moving around in. You can also use this as an opportunity to play up how strange all of these insects being present are. Give players who are trained in society the opportunity to realize how unusual it is to see pests within city walls, or those trained in nature may notice the types of centipedes which make up some of the centipede swarms. They're not native for 50 miles around Nentambu, so it's very unusual to see them here. While the gremlins and stone ghosts are the main antagonists of book one, seeding hints as to the true threat of the campaign and the vesicant egg at the same time adds layers to the story and builds reasons for characters to stay engaged in the long term, rather than risking them losing interest after the gremlin threat is dispatched. The second mini-adventure sees the player characters exploring the tree stump library to retrieve some 
some books for Teacher Ott. Even though there are only a few rooms and encounters, this is a great way to orient new players to Pathfinder to the idea of having multiple fights in a single day, as well as how to use exploration activities to investigate rooms, find clues, loot, and traps. The rooms are close enough together that if your players are more seasoned and easily dispatch the scripts, you can combine multiple rooms together into one large ambush. The giant silverfish burst through some rotten doors at the same time as the swarms crawl through cracks in the walls. This will create a second moderate encounter for a level two group of four. The Ritual with Zuma is a fun roleplay centric encounter with the big goal being to add another ritual to the player's repertoire. Again, especially if you aren't adding a lot of other opportunities for players to engage with NPCs, Having other NPC students around and participating with Zuma can make the campus feel more alive. The Star Day Tournament is another dungeon, so to speak, presented in a different manner, as the heroes battle their way through increasingly challenging tournament opponents. The maximum of two players on the field at any given time is a unique limitation that my players had a lot of fun with. They were able to strategize which combinations of characters had the most synergy, and how to tactically make use of that five minutes between rounds, which means that a PC that participated in round one would have a 10 minute period to treat wounds and refocus by the time round three began. Again, for players new to Pathfinder 2 especially, this provides great in-character ways to discuss what each PC's capabilities are and may open the player's eyes to some of the tactile options that Pathfinder 2 has. The last few pages before the first masking encounter create brief ideas on ways to incorporate other NPC students into the PC's daily lives. I found the best way to use these was to have them be things that happened around the heroes instead of to them. The heroes walk in from class and Okoro has the game board laid out in the Spire Dorms common area, or they hear Anchor Root wailing and can choose to investigate her room if they want. Approaching them this way puts the agency into the player's hands. They don't have to engage with every hook or be the center of every quest. The world can actually feel more immersive if campus life just sort of happens around the players. It continues on and they can choose who and what they want to engage with in more detail. The final set piece and drama of chapter two is the first masking. Take the advice of the first masking being all the initiates can talk about seriously, even considering dropping hints about it between the earlier sections of the chapter as well. The more it's built up as this momentous step forward for the students, the more dramatic the impending bug attack will be. As a brief aside, I've stated in other videos that I am a big fan of props, and for the first masking, I purchased a set of blank paper masquerade masks on Amazon, along with some acrylic paint markers. This actually gave the players an opportunity to make their own mask for real during the first masking ceremony, and much like the beads that I mentioned in my last props video, it gives the players a bit of a costume to help them get more into character and give them something to play around with during the scenes where their character may not be in the spotlight, such as during downtime activities. Definitely an optional touch, but something that I thought the module made really easy to incorporate in. But back to the encounter. Once again, this battlefield set amidst the tireless hall gives a lot of flexibility to adjust difficulty on the fly if the characters are having too easy or too hard a time. To get mathy for a moment, the Goliath Beetle has a plus 11 bonus to hit with its mandibles. That means around a 20% chance to crit for 24 average damage and knock out most casters in one hit. Its second attack is at a plus six, which means a turn where it strides and strikes a caster twice also has around a 35% chance of downing them before they can react. If that proves devastating and you lose a few players early, a timely healing spell from a teacher can help get the PCs back on track. Conversely, you can add a few extra flash beetles and giant centipedes that emerge from cracks in the tireless hall in rounds two and three if the combat is going really well for the PCs, they're working as a well-oiled machine and knocking out a lot of the threats early on. It still helps keep the tension of the situation high as players are wondering, will the bug swarms ever stop? As the dust settles both figuratively and literally over the tireless hall, this brings us to the end of chapter two. In the next video, I'll discuss how I approached the dungeon crawl that makes up most of chapter three of Kindled Magic, as well as some of the techniques to avoid players feeling like the teachers of the Magambia, they might be a little incompetent. 
a fairly common challenge I've seen expressed in various online communities, and one that I definitely ran into at my table as well. But until then, thanks for joining me, and thank you so much for all the feedback that you've shared in the comments. It definitely keeps this fun for me and helps me improve and grow. Until next time, thanks and take care.